Hello and welcome back to another Out of Spec Reviews video. You joined me in my Model 3 where I thought we'd go for a drive and talk about the 11 EVs you should be thankful for this Thanksgiving. Coincidentally, the day this video goes live. Um, you don't have to agree with me. Maybe you shouldn't be thankful for these cars. These are at least the ones that I'm thankful for and I'm ready to share the list of 11 cars that I'm really thankful for in 2021. <laughs> The list, by the way, is in no particular order, but I kind of weighted it by relevance, but don't take it you know, too seriously. I just put up 11 cars that I was really, really into this year and thankful that they happened, starting with the Lucid Air. I think it's a super transformative vehicle, maybe not so much on the vehicle side itself. I haven't had a chance to test a production version yet. I don't know, but if anything, the car has led to a mind shift change to say, Wow, Tesla's been beat at their own on paper game. Should we go through Starbucks? We should go through Starbucks, it's the morning time. And look, at the end of the day, it sounds like the car is gonna be amazing. My friend Tom just did a zero to 100% DC fast charging test, and that sounds like it did awesome. 304 kilowatt peak, I believe. All sounds pretty spicy, but at the end of the day, 520 miles of range, uh, you know, 1,111 horsepower, not on the same car, I realize. Uh, but then also just sort of showing Tesla what others are doing right now, I think is pretty exciting. Now, I love that the wars are heating up. We finally had an automaker match Tesla at the on-paper game. And yeah, can't wait to put them head to head, of course, in our own efficiency range and charging testing that we'll conduct here on this channel. But yeah, it's just been a transformative vehicle altogether. And yeah, I'm very excited about the Lucid Air. Next up, the Rivian R1T. The R1T and R1S were grouping into one category and I just had a chance to drive it for the first time. If you haven't watched that video, it's again on this channel, my sort of first drive experience or review of the Rivian. And it was a very short taste, but at the end of the day, regardless of the minutia of the car, the brake pedal, the throttle feel, the way you can drift it around, that isn't really what matters about that truck. What matters is it embodies the spirit of adventure in an electric car for the first time, I would say. I mean, years ago, back when I started driving electric cars, it was stopping at campgrounds and there were no DC chargers. And I remember just driving my early i3 with my best friend Ben from Raleigh to the tail of the dragon. And it took 15 hours because we would have to, we had to zigzag from Raleigh to Charlotte to the north, almost to Virginia and over just to use DC chargers. Now we had a range extender gas motor in it, could have kicked that thing on, but no, we wanted to do it using public infrastructure and that's still the spirit of what we do today and now we just are able to film these things on youtube for you guys but early days the spirit of adventure was just getting places in an electric car and now we've reached the point where we can actually go places where most people haven't been able to go in a normal combustion vehicle before. Uh, certainly, I think there will be more capable combustion vehicles out for overlanding use. We're talking Broncos, JL Wranglers, you know, real purpose-built upgraded stuff. But in terms of an electric car, I'm not sure there's gonna be anything that can come close to sort of what excites me about overlanding. We have an out-of-spec overlanding channel now, by the way, uh, as much as the Rivian does. And so for that, I'm excited for the new wave of adventuring by way of electrons. Hey, could I have a Trenta strawberry acai, please? Yeah, what up for you? And can I do that with light ice, no water, and no inclusions, but Perfect. still shaken, please? What up for you? That should do it. All right, 532. Thank you. Next up on the list is the Tesla Model S Plaid. Again, this whole defying expectations or defying perceptions, if you will. Um, look, the Plaid's not the fastest electric car. It might be the fastest production electric car, but we've seen the Rimats smoke it down the runway, uh, down the drag strip. But at the end of the day, the Plaid is an insane car, and I'm just thankful for the conversations that it's brought up. It has put this car against this car in electric versus combustion. At the end of the day, I personally don't care what people buy. I drive an electric car because I think it's cool, it's fast, it's fun, fun to play around with. But if you want to buy a combustion car, look, I'm into it. I love combustion cars too. Uh, the Plaid's just faster. It's just, at the end of the day, it's the smackdown. It's like, holy smokes, this thing rips. And I've been lucky enough to launch a Plaid numerous times now, and it's still 
one of the most brutal experiences you could ever imagine. Look, there's a lot I don't love about the car, um, but there's a lot that I do love about the car, and there's no question that that thing in a straight line is just an absolute monster, and, well, I'm very thankful for it. Number four on the list brings us to the Volkswagen ID4. Finally, we have some relatively attainable, at least lower than your average new car sale price. I think the average new car sale for this year in the US was $44,000. This ID4 starts at $39,900 with the big battery pack, and it gets a $7,500 federal tax credit if you can qualify, and it gets three years of free charging on Electrify America and state incentives like every other electric car. At the end of the day, I think it's the best value EV on sale. It just won our big comparison. Well, I named it the winner, so I made it win, uh, <laughs> compared to Maki, -E, Polestar 2, as well as Model Y. I think it drives really well, and I think it's really Volkswagen's new Beetle, if you will. Um, it's going to electrify the masses, and I am here for it. I can't wait to see ID4s everywhere. They're already sold out. Our dealer here in town, Ed Carroll in Fort Collins, we're friends of theirs. A lot of you guys have decided to order your Volkswagens with our local dealer here, just because they're so good to us, keep loaning us cars and letting us film with their vehicles and things like that. Um, yeah, and they're just sold out for like a while. So <laughs> everyone seems to want one. A lot of people in my family have had them. And uh, yeah, I think ID4 by far is one of the most influential vehicles of this year. And it definitely goes a little bit overlooked in the grand scheme of things. As transformative as the ID4 has been for regular buyers, I think the F-150 Lightning will be very transformative for pickup truck buyers. So let me explain my thinking here. When someone comes to me and they say, hey Kyle, I just need a car. You review cars, what should I buy? And I'm not really into cars, just need to get around, want something comfortable, kind of nice. I get that like 50 times a day. Uh, maybe not that much, but you, you guys get the point. It's Volkswagen ID4. I'm like, that's just the default car for me. It's like what a Prius was, you know, 10 years ago. Oh, you, don't, you really don't care about cars. You want an economical way to get around with a lot of space, buy a Prius. Now, ID4, fully electric, safe, comfortable, massaging seats on the mid trim and up, uh, gl beautiful glass roof on mid trim and up, very quiet cabin, built well, ID4. I think the F-150 Lightning will do that same exact thing for pickup truck buyers. Hey Kyle, I need a pickup truck. I just do, you know, occasional work, tow my boat here or there, you know, not not going across the country in my truck or anything like that, just doing local local work, which is what most pickup trucks are used for. F-150 Lightning. I hope. We have to test it. We need to see. But I just went for my first ride in F-150 Lightning. The price is astonishingly good, especially for fleet customers. And I think that's where that truck's going to make most of its impact in this world is on its fleet pricing uh, for the base spec model. Some of these guys that tow big distances, that do, you know, huge trailers over long distances, it's not going to be for them. Charging station design is going to be really annoying with trailers, I'm telling you right now. They're not designed for it. Um, yeah, imagine pulling in these little tiny Walmart parking lots with a huge horse trailer on the back. Good luck and no thank you. But for around town work, for 99% of the use case of a truck unloaded even, uh, I think that F-150 Lightning is just going to be the default pickup truck of choice. And I am glad Ford, and I'm thankful for Ford for making it and really putting it at the forefront of what they're doing. Uh, just, you know, a nice thing that I'm able to do is, you know, attend some of these auto shows and, you know, see what companies are presenting up front. And I walk through the GM booth and there's literally zero electric cars this year at the Los Angeles Auto Show, even though everyone, including the president, say they're leading the electrification charge, which just seems crazy to me. They didn't even bring one electric thing. They didn't even bring anything that said about their electric feature. Meanwhile, you walk up to Ford and it's F100 powered by a Mach-E and then F-150 Lightning on the stand. They put the Ford GT off in the corner and the F-150 Lightning was front and center. And so look, you, mad props to Ford for going so heavy into EV. I hope it works for them. I hope the trucks are really capable and I'm just thankful that it's opened the conversation for truck owners to say, huh, 
maybe electric is the way. Now, don't get me wrong. There will be diesel trucks for a really long time. There's a use case for them. Uh, even in my case, I have a diesel Sprinter. I don't think that would work as an electric vehicle with today's technology because I do huge distances at high speeds in this giant 10,000 pound high roof vehicle. It just would be so annoying to road trip as electric. But there will be enough electric use cases to sell every single F-150 Lightning they can make and I'm so excited for it. Next up on the list is the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and Kia EV6. Uh, I would put GV60 on there as well, so let's just do that as well. We'll basically say any of the eGMP platform cars. What Hyundai Group has been able to do is just smoke everyone with this one chassis. They said 800 volt system architecture, they're going to charge like monsters, like literal monsters, 10 minute, zero to 50% charging in these cars. And I am so excited for the technology that that car brings, the driving dynamics. I've been able to drive EV6, looking forward to Ionic 5 in a couple weeks. And overall, they're going to be expensive. I don't think they're going to be cheap. Like I, ID4 is still going to be a, a, it's going to be a big gap is my guess up to an Ionic 5 or EV6 from an ID4. So I think ID4 is still the default car of choice but if you want the default car of choice but you're really into tech and fast charging and hyundai honestly makes a, a wonderful product across their entire range a, a, as well as kia and genesis then ionic 5 and ev6 and gv60 are amazing and they have just smoked mercedes even at bringing 800 volt system technology to the game now 800 volts isn't the end all be all but it does allow for fast charging and that's what i'm into and that brings us to the next car the mercedes eqs i am so unbelievably thankful for the eqs because guys everyone's been saying a model s is a luxury car let's be honest and i named the plaid you know i i think that's an amazing car i i loved it i gave it a glowing review except for when you try and drive it fast up a back road it's a great car i've owned model s but it's not a luxury car we haven't had a luxurious electric car up until now and while the eqs is not a pretty car to look at my opinion, uh, I think driving it is one of the most magical driving experiences ever. And I just love the to get into that car, put on the massaging seats, turn all the noise off. I don't want any of the, the fake pumped in noise. You can have active noise cancellation, truly amazing sound design in that vehicle. And then uh, we'll go to the right here. And you know, it's just unlike anything else. So yeah, I'm happy we finally have EQS bringing luxury and electrification together in one car because that's exactly the perfect use case for an electric car is it's quiet, comfortable, has loads of torque, gives you a feeling of confidence. How could you not want an electric luxury car? And thanks to Mercedes with EQS, now we have one. Next up on the list, another Ford product, Mustang Mach-E. And while Mustang Mach-E is you know, to get like a really fast one, a GT Performance Edition, for example, you're talking 60, almost 70 Gs, still in the 60s, priced really well, don't get me wrong. I think that car, more than the actual vehicle itself, has brought the conversation of electrification to more people than any others. I mentioned F-150 Lightning gets pickup truck owners talking about electric cars. Mustang, now electric, has got more people in the entire country talking about cars because everyone has a Mustang story. You either remember the first time you rode in one, your parents' Mustang, you know, generationally Mustang is so important to our culture. And now that there's an electric Mustang Mach-E, you know, forget about the car and its, you know, details, if it's really great or really bad, depending on how you view it. I think it's a really good car, genuinely, but there's some small details that bug me, um, except for the Performance Edition. That's like nearly perfect, except it overheats when you drive it hard. Um, it has just opened the doors to people thinking about electric cars differently. And some people don't like it. Some people hate that there's an electric Mustang. Some people love it. I just love that it's opened the minds of people to say, holy smokes, electric cars are actually here now, all thanks to the Mustang Mach-E. I think that's done the, the biggest shift in, in mindset this year. And Ford had a lot to go up against when they named the Mach-E a Mustang. And I think they made the right decision. 
I don't necessarily think it drives like a combustion Mustang. Of course, it's an electric car. It's very different, but I think it's a new character of Mustang that we have yet to see, and I'm glad it's here, and I know so many happy owners that are just loving their cars. And by the way, Ford was the first ones, they've done some innovation with this car to bring plug-in charge on a non-Tesla vehicle, so CCS plug-in charge on a mass-produced vehicle here in the US. I think they were number one. It was buggy, but they did it and they took the risk. And Volkswagen, by the way, still doesn't have plug-in charge for a Volkswagen car on a Volkswagen network. It's still not a thing. So at the end of the day, Mustang Mach-E, extremely thankful for this car. Next up is the Taycan Sport Turismo GTS. Now, you guys know I'm a big Taycan fan because I'm a big Porsche fan, and so call me biased, but at the end of the day, uh, enthusiast drivers uh, can now order and spec a fast electric wagon, which has just been the biggest win for the wagon community, if you will. I love wagons. Uh, it's no secret. Volvo wagons, V90s, I just double take. I'll turn around to go take pictures of them. Look, I am a wagon guy. And now we can get a non-lifted off-roady version like the Cross Turismo. We now have the Sport Turismo Taycan. It looks amazing. The GTS is the perfect trim level for that car because it's going to be the most drifty and the most exciting, the most enthusiast oriented with the longest uh, thermal, uh, uh, I guess, cooling strategy. So you can drive it as hard as you want. And in theory, it will delay the time for when it actually overheats. 800 volt system architecture, crazy fast charging, actually more efficient the faster you drive it up to a certain point, of course. But that car is sweet spots like 70, 75 miles an hour. Just insane high speed cruiser, extremely complex complicated car, but um, I am so thankful personally for the Taycan Sport Turismo GTS, finally a fast wagon that I can buy. And next is the Polestar 2 Performance Pack, and I thought maybe we should combine XC40 Recharge with Polestar 2, but I think Polestar 2 is more transformative than XC40 Recharge because we've seen a uh, combustion automaker Volvo transition and spin off a new company, you know, partly on Volvo and Geely. It's all kind of pretty much the same big thing uh, into Polestar, which is now a fully electric company. Now that Polestar 1 is pretty much ending, um, Polestar 2, Polestar 5, all of these new Polestar cars and models that are coming out, it will be a fully electric company with a um, dealership sales model, but giving you the impression of a direct sales manufacturer um, buying process. The cars have so much Swedish flair and attention to detail that driving around in a Polestar is just cool. And for those people who love Nordic design and just overall Volvos in the past, I guess, now there's an electric one. And by the way, you can get big Olin's suspension. It's a really nice adjustable suspension. Brembo brakes and it's in like this weird fastback SUV sedan styled beautiful looking Swedish hatchback thing and I love everything about Polestar 2. There's some minutia again in the throttle pedal calibration that kind of bugs me but at the end of the day uh, Polestar 2 is one of the coolest cars and if you see a performance pack one specifically driving around you know that owner like went out of their way to just buy a neat car so you gotta love that next up is the mini cooper se uh it's no secret i'm a mini fan i have been for a really long time but in the grand scheme of electrification it represents the brand's second fully electric model the first electric model was the mini e launching in 2009 can't remember exactly um, and that car was that car was really quite interesting that was before j1772 was even a thing uh, it had a big battery pack I think actually it had the same if not more range than the Mini Cooper SE but what the Mini Cooper SE allows for is at least in the US a city sized electric car uh, that's actually selling really well for the brand. They're actually doing well. One of my colleagues who works for Out of Spec, Mike, just bought one. Uh, and, and the more car enthusiasts I run into kind of have them as daily drivers, which I think is the perfect use case and solution for a Mini Cooper SE. Overall, it allows for city use in the US, um, you know, to have a small, nimble electric car. We don't get the smart car anymore. We don't get the Fiat 500e anymore. Uh, and the Honda E never came here, but what we do have is the Mini Cooper SE as a relatively affordable, 
not amazing statistic car, but great charging curve, really fun to drive, and a very premium electric car for the money. And there you have it. Those are my 11 top picks for cars that we should be thankful for this year, at least the ones that I am. And let me know if you agree or disagree. I mean, this was just, you know, not the most well-researched video or thought out or anything. You guys know I'm pretty pretty basic when it comes to it, but we got went for a nice drive in the Model 3. I haven't driven this car in a long time. Battery's cold. It's 31 degrees outside. I got the blue snowflake here on the screen. And um, yeah, just backing it into the uh, driveway now. I hope you all have a happy Thanksgiving. I hope we can talk about EVs for the next year or so in a positive way, although there will be a lot of challenges to a full electric transition that we will be covering. Hope to see you all in the next video. Thanks for watching. And by the way, myself and everyone at Out of Spec, super thankful for all of you for watching our videos to make what we do possible. We are living in a dream world and it wouldn't have happened without you guys watching our content. See you on the next one. Bye-bye.